The eugenists had blind faith in modern science that led to utopianism. Dressed up in quasi-religious terminology, the eugenics faith promised to create heaven on earth through the magic of human breeding. The Garden of Eden is not in the past, it's in the future, promised eugenist Albert Wiggum. Confident that modern biology had revealed to them how to breed a better race, eugenists set about turning their scientific ideas into action by restricting those who could marry, by limiting immigration from nations eugenists thought were lower on the evolutionary scale than we were, and by enacting compulsory sterilization laws. By the early 1930s, 30 states had enacted such laws, and eugenists were marketing forced sterilization as the solution to what they depicted as a looming welfare crisis. In a 1926 speech at Vassar College promoting sterilization, Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger spoke in near-apocalyptic terms about the ruinous cost to taxpayers of welfare spending to care for defectives. In 1923, over nine billions of dollars were spent on state and federal charities for the care and maintenance and perpetuation of these undesirables. Year by year, their numbers are mounting. Year by year, their cost is increasing. Huge sums, yes, vast fortunes are expended on these, while the normal parents and their children are compelled to shift for themselves and compete with each other. The American public is taxed, heavily taxed, to maintain an increasing race of morons, which threatens the very foundations of our civilization. Our eyes should be opened to the terrific cost to the community of this dead weight of human waste. Eugenists' tendency to depict the underclass almost exclusively as a threat represented a sharp break with the humanitarian principles espoused by traditional philanthropy. Heavily influenced by Judeo-Christian idealism, traditional welfare workers viewed those at the bottom of the social ladder as fellow human beings worthy of sympathy, mercy, care, and exhortation. Eugenists, by contrast, branded them as enemies of civilization that needed to be eradicated. Despite aside that sterilization would be good for presumed defectives as well as for society, the eugenist harsh rhetoric clearly dehumanized the poor, most of whom were labeled as feeble-minded or otherwise subhuman. According to biologist Charles Davenport, such feeble-minded persons represented animalistic strains from earlier stages of evolution, and carried along with them a torrent of defective and degenerate protoplasm. Harvard biologist Edward East dubbed them the parasitic fraction of the population, saying they were like a cancerous growth on the healthy tissues of society. Eugenists also criticized traditional welfare programs for ignoring biological reality and relying instead on sentimental ideals of humanitarianism and human equality. Margaret Sanger warned of the dangers inherent in the very idea of humanitarianism and altruism, dangers which have today produced their full harvest of human waste, of inequality and inefficiency, she wrote. Harvard's Edward East attacked as unscientific the idea that man is created in the image of God and suggested that the claim that all human beings have equal worth is ludicrous. One of our prominent social workers is quoted as saying that Every child is worth $5,000 to society. Stuff and nonsense. Some of them are not worth 5,000 Soviet rubles. They are liabilities, not assets. Others are worth golden millions. If prosperity is to be promoted, the assets should be increased and the liabilities reduced. By 1940, almost 36,000 men and women had been sterilized in public institutions across the United States. Nearly half of the operations occurred in California, which performed more than 14,000 sterilizations. Next in line was Virginia, which sterilized nearly 4,000 people. Seven other states performed more than 1,000 sterilizations each. All told, government-sponsored sterilizations took place in 30 states, and 46% of the operations were performed on those classified as feeble-minded, an expansive and slippery category defined largely by prejudice. It's important to understand that the feeble-minded 
included more than just those who would be considered mentally handicapped today. Indeed, to the untrained observer, many feeble-minded persons might seem perfectly normal. They could read, they could work, they could function and do the tasks that everyone else does. That, in fact, was the problem. People might mistake the feeble-minded for normal people and marry them by mistake, spreading their defective genes to the next generation. The feeble-minded were far more dangerous than obviously mentally handicapped individuals because they could seem so normal. Perhaps the most infamous case of the slipshod way in which people were labeled feeble-minded and selected for sterilization was the case of Carrie Buck. This impoverished Virginia woman was forcibly sterilized in the late 1920s after her appeal failed before the U.S. Supreme Court. This was the case where Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes chillingly declared, Three generations of imbeciles are enough. By the time of her death in the early 1980s, however, Carrie Buck was no longer considered mentally unfit. She was said to be an avid reader, and she wrote perfectly coherent letters. She married, joined the Methodist Church, and returned to singing in the church choir. Her first marriage lasted nearly a quarter of a century, ending with her husband's death in 1956. Her second marriage lasted until her own death in 1983. She spent most of her adult life helping others, wrote J. David Smith. She was a trusted caregiver to elderly people, and one of her employers told me that Carrie couldn't have been mentally retarded. Her competence was obvious, she said, in the quality of care she gave to those who depended on her. There was nothing wrong with that woman's mind, said the employer.